we just hit the moment where neither one of us want to go take a number one and touch our you know what, because we will now know why it would be burning. Hey, what's going on everybody? For First We Feast, I'm Sean Evans and you're watching Hot Ones. It's the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. And today we're joined by Matthew McConaughey, He's an Academy Award-winning actor you know from films like Magic Mike, Dallas Buyers Club, Interstellar, and countless others. His latest project, however, is a memoir titled Green Lights, which is set to release on October 20th. Matthew McConaughey, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here, Sean. I'm hungry, too. Well, speaking of hungry, I saw that jalapeno-loaded cheeseburger that you made with Aaron Franklin earlier this year. So I take it you're a guy who likes the spicy food. I do like spicy food. I mean, look, been able to travel around the world, pick out different spices all over. Um... I'm not uh, the guy that chases down the ghost pepper to just see how much I can tolerate, which might be what I'm gonna be doing here in the next hour. But um, I, do, I do like a little kick uh, to, to my food. Classic garlic fresno. Easy on the nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Garlic up front. Mm -hmm. Not too spicy. Comes on in the second gear, lets you know it's got a little hit to it. So I want to start by talking about your upcoming book, Green Lights, which you describe as a love letter to life, chock full of stories and memories from keeping a diary for over 36 years. Yeah. And you really went full Henry Thoreau at Walden Pond to write it, holding yourself up in the desert for 52 days with no electricity. Do you typically seek out that level of solitude when you're writing? I'm pretty fond of taking backpack trips on my own to places where nobody knows my name and they don't speak the language for 22 days or less. Or more um so that's a form of solitary confinement and you go someplace where nobody knows your name and they don't speak the language um so to write this i'd been daring myself to open that treasure chest of diaries and actually go see what the hell it all was if i could make a book out of it for years and finally i got a little time off that treasure chest of diaries started barking at me going come on McConaughey, i dare you I dare you about the same time my wife goes you know what you got to do get the hell out of here pack everything up so i packed up my food, my water, my booze, and I loaded all my diaries in and went out to a cabin in the middle of the desert. What happened in those diaries where they fell into seven categories. They were stories, people, places, poems, prayers, prescribes, and a whole lot of bumper stickers. And so I was like, okay, there's my seven col there's my eight columns. Um, and then I went back home, checked in on my honeydews, did my work, caught up, and then popped out for another 12 days. So I did it five different times for about 10 to 12 days apiece. This is a very good looking label, by the way. Dawson's. That's actually sweeter than the first one. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's a winner already. I'm going to move that out front a little bit. Dawson's. <laughs> that's real good. So in 2019, you were minted as the Minister of Culture at your alma mater, the University of Texas, which, as I understand it, is a position that kind of oversees the intersection of tradition, sports, and commerce within the athletic department. When you took that position, what were some of the specific changes that you thought needed to happen in order to define a culture within that capitalistic ecosystem of major college sports? Yeah, so within the university, it started off me saying, look, the same values that create a championship team on the field are the same values that can create a champion in the classroom that can go off and do good through their education and learn to be an expert in something. So let's get those aligned and then it worked its way into sort of architecture and interior design of our new arena. What's the relationship for the crowd with the team? How do we make it the first place that any band wants to play in the world, but the last place any visiting team wants to come play? Well, a lot of that's engineering. Where's the student section? How close to the floor? What's the pitch? Is it standing room only? Where's it standing room only? How can you be up in the cheaper seats but still have a great experience in the, in the, in the arena and not just be up in the cheap seat? How can each area of the arena have a different experience? How do we make sure we're bringing local retailers, food and beverage from Austin into the arena? Things like that. And then I'm also working with Austin FC, the uh, our, our, new, our new football club, soccer club, doing the same stuff. A 
Oh, by the way, that little one I was saying is so sweet a minute ago. Halfway into me it talking to little... you, it had a little late, came back in overtime and kind of sort of got a little spicy. Okay. It's almost a morbid Jamaican jerk. Got a little mm -hmm. sweetness plus pepper in it. So Matthew, you've been so prolific in film over the last 25 years, it'd be impossible to check every box, but we'll try to hit some highlights here while you enjoy that wing. I read that Christopher Nolan refused to use green screen while making Interstellar. What's the most jaw-dropping set you saw actually physically built for a scene in that film? The Tesseract. That, again, wasn't a green screen. I was dealing with a physical Tesseract and they were, I'd push off of it and I was on the pool and they, I, I was 80 feet above the ground swinging out and then they'd swing me back. And we rehearsed that quite a bit, um, just so it could be done safely um, and look like zero gravity. But the Tesseract was a massive set that was built. So many other things you think Nolan does massive, not. When you have like Cooper falling through space, Nolan's over on on like a, uh, there's a, 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 a tripod and there's a, uh, a like a 12 foot metal uh, pipe. And I just strapped to that and Nolan's on the other side like a seesaw just maneuvering it left and right. He's like he was like he was in film school at university. And that's and that's what you could come up with. Which was a more nerve-wracking onset experience? The onstage thong scene in Magic Mike or petting a live tiger in gold? Ah, that's a great question. <laughs> I gotta go with Magic Mike because somebody somebody's hand when I was down there went a little far. And I and I was like, "Ooh, this is about to be it." And I, I I snuck out of there. <laughs> I snuck out of there just in time to come out as covered as I could be. Yeah, now touching that damn tiger was a different kind of buzz. I remember the uh, heartbeat started racing a little bit right there. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And then finally, you've been in some of the most beloved and highest grossing rom-coms of all time. Yeah. What are the hallmarks of a good romantic comedy? Like when they work, what makes them work? Yeah, here's what it is. So listen. And I've thought a lot about this because we all know it's going to happen in the rom-com. Boy meets girl. Uh, some reason they break up. Boy chases girl. Hops on a moped or a bridge or somewhere at the end. Boy catches girl. They get together at the end. We know that's the story. Though. So what we got to do is say, can we enjoy that journey if we already know where the story's going to end up? It's really so important about who the two leads are. Here's the, here's the third thing. A good one has it lets the audience in on a joke that one of the characters doesn't know meaning if you for people that enjoy how to lose a guy they would enjoy it when they the audience knew something and i my character knew something how i was going to do kate in a scene when she didn't know it so they were in on the joke oh we're gonna get her and then vice versa when the audience was in on something with her character where she was duping me the audience is having a whole lot of fun going yeah yeah he's about to get screwed over you know that was a lot of the fun in the interactivity that i think people enjoy about rom-coms when they do enjoy them and we go go right got a little molasses in it yeah, and a little more kick, I think, than the first three. Yeah, especially, yeah. Comes in low and longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Angry goat. You'd figure an angry goat would have a little bit of kick. Yeah. So I know that you're a highwayman at heart, sometimes driving 1,700 miles on a whim and uninterrupted. And I know that in the early 2000s, you went from concert to baseball game to wherever the wind took you on an Airstream trailer you nicknamed Canoe. Which part of the country, besides your beloved Texas, did you find the friendliest, most down to help you with directions type people? People like to say that like New Yorkers are, you know, gruff. They don't want to help. I've always found New Yorkers to be great at like helping with directions. Now, mind you, New Yorkers aren't looking to see, looking for people to say, hey, can I help you? No, they're on their way doing something. But when you stop one uh, and get their attention, I always found they get great direction. What I find most interesting about your experience in particular is you were doing this before there was like ubiquitous internet and cell phone coverage, but you were really just right there in the middle of your career. What's like the biggest hot shot Hollywood meeting that you ever did at like a roadside rest stop or at a campsite? Yeah, well, see, this, this is what I would do. So if I had a big meeting and I did have quite a few, I would pick directors up in one place and then drive towards my destination, drop them off at the, 
the airport there and they'd fly out. It was always fun when that, like I was headed towards somewhere real cool and it'd be like, oh, I'll just come pick you up in Vegas as I'm pulling out. Or, you know, um, Roger Clemens is pitching three nights from now. I'm going to, I'm headed up there to go watch him pitch or King to Leon somewhere playing in a concert. I'm actually heading there in three days, hop in, I'll drop you off. Um, and those were all, I hit every single state besides North Dakota. I got a feeling this is going to sneak up a little bit. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right. I like the setup. And I got a feeling my sentences are about to start getting shorter. <laughs> All right, Matthew, we have a recurring segment on our show called Explain That Gram, where we do a deep dive on our guest's Instagram, pull interesting pictures that need more context. So I'll show you the picture. You just tell us the bigger story. Yeah. First things first, you were on the sidelines at the 2006 Rose Bowl game, which many sports writers call the greatest college football game of all time. What is your lasting memory of that? Vince Young, when he was playing, it was almost like 14 versus 11. And you saw what he did in that national championship game against USC. He had such poise in that game and was having so much fun. He was able to be so present in that game that there was a television timeout in the third quarter when we were down by about 10 points. I don't know what it was. They brought out three USC alumni on the opposite end of the field to just sort of be, the they were gonna announce their name and the crowd was gonna go, great alumni, they achieved these things. Vince left the huddle, ran down, took off his helmet and shook all their hands and met him. And the ref had to come over and go, hey, we gotta get back to the game, we're starting. He was like, oh yeah. That's how present that guy was. He knew we were gonna win that game. He knew we were gonna score on that final drive when we did beat USC. He knew it. Arguably the best, one of the best college players there's ever been. When we had Justin Timberlake on the show, he said you have to get Woody Harrelson on Hot Ones. You've described him as one of the last wild men walking on earth and a longtime friend. What's going on in this picture? Oh yeah, that's my brother right there. So obviously, so you know, this is, uh, I would say this is probably uh, towards the AM, towards the beginning of an AM, or maybe just into an AM. Uh, um, <laughs> oh, I love it. And with there is, you don't hear it, but there is, uh, I think Metallica's playing extremely loudly on major concert sized speakers. And Lars Ulrich may be there just outside of the uh, frame and a few other people. Uh, that that are in the rock and roll business, and uh, we are breaking a sweat on the dance on the dance floor. Even though there's really not a dance floor, um, we're, we're we're breaking a sweat, getting it out right now, shaking it, shaking our tail feather, put some elbow grease into it. All right, we're into this little guy here, Heartbeat Hot Sauce, Thunder Bay, Ontario. I got a good friend from Thunder Bay. What's up, Pino? So some fans watching this might be surprised to learn that you actually teach a course at the University of Texas called Script to Screen, which follows the process of making a film from its original screenplay to the movie that audiences ultimately experience in theaters. What are some of the things that would surprise people about the science behind the magic of making a film? So after doing this for 28 years, man, I really started to notice that, boy, that product that we put on the screen that you go to the theater and see, or turn on your tube and see, very different from that original script I read a year ago or two years ago. Because I always thought, well, you see the written script, it has to be exactly that. We have to shoot exactly what's on the page. And no, I learned, started learning that from Richard Linklater, my very first film, Days of Confused. It's a collaboration. There's one director, but you take inspiration and ideas and good ones from wherever they come from, whether it's the PA or whether it's the actor or whoever. You take, you look at the scene you're in, you take inspiration, you work with what you have. It became much more of a fun process to direct and be a part of a movie like that. What I said is, look, I want to take these film students chronologically through first script, a second script, a third script, a fourth script, a shooting script, first edit, and a final picture that you see. How you can maybe run out of money and have to lose one of the big action scenes that was your favorite scene because you don't have the money for it uh, and have to rewrite something else. To see how, oh, someone like myself, three lines in the first movie, read the Days Confused script, which we're, we, that's the script we're script screen doing in our class right now at Texas. You'll see that, awesome. you'll see that I was in like three scenes, had three lines. And you're gonna be like, whoa, 
He ended up being working for three weeks. He was all, Wooderson was all through that movie. Vice versa, you may see someone who had a big part and then you go see the movie and you go, what happened to their part? It's but smaller now. So you just see where all the changes are. So it's sort of, that's when I say putting the signs behind the magic of movie making. It's letting these different students know the different ways that films and movies and TV shows go from the script to finally get the screen. We we're seven sauce the, hellfire. A little smoky in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So not since we had Shia LaBeouf on the show have I had a more pressing urge to fact check the folklore surrounding a guest as I do right now. Is it true that the patron saint of Hot Ones himself, Guy Fieri, catered the after party of your wedding? Fact. Yeah, man. Guy's great. Guy, guy reached out. Uh, we hooked up probably... I don't know, 10 years ago and remained in contact. Um, he actually, I introduced him when he got his uh, Walk on the Hall of Fame here recently, just a few months ago. He also jammed and uh, cooked burgers at my 50th birthday. Yeah, he's been a good bud, man. And uh, yeah, he, he loves to get on some spice. Okay. That is this one? <laughs> okay. Number seven <laughs> just got sneaky and starts to get heated outside the lines. This is the first time my lips and things that this is one you don't want to, all right, neither one, we just hit the moment where neither one of us want to go take a number one and touch our you know what, because we will now know why it would be burning. Okay. Very smart, very smart. And wait until you try the next one. Wait until right. you try the next one. Right. Fact or fiction, you once collected every bad review that you could find about yourself and then read them obsessively as a way to like improve as an actor? Yeah, I was just learning to see if what I thought I was doing was how it was coming across. I gathered up all of my bad reviews and it was a it was a thick, thick notebook. And I found some of people to be very constructive. I found some other ones to be like, oh, this person, it didn't matter. They, they already wrote this review. They didn't like me. They wrote this review before they even came in the movie. And then I found a lot of it to be very funny, um, but funny in a good way. Um, and I got some good tips. I learned more from my bad reviews than I did from my good ones. Is it true that you lost a lawsuit against a skin cream company because you won most attractive senior in your yearbook? So true, and the story is in the book. I'll give you the short version. My mom starts peddling this stuff called oil of mink. It's just door-to-door -door sales, and it's, it's, it's just oil. You put this mink all over your face, and it'll bring out the impurities, and whatever impurities you have, it'll bring them out, and they'll be gone forever, and you'll have beautiful glowing skin for the rest of your life. I do it for three weeks straight. I get full-blown acne unrecognizably swollen head. I go to the dermatologist. He's like, what are you putting on your face? I go, here's this oil of mink. He goes, no, you're 15 years old and you, you, it's clogging your pores. This is for people 40 years and older. Well, my dad goes, gosh, damn, we ought to, da, 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 da. I mean, no, 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 no. Young man should be, young adolescent should be taking this stuff. We're going to sue that company. So he goes to his, his a lawyer. He goes, what do you think, Jerry? He goes, oh, we can get thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars. This is emotional distress. Matthew, were you emotionally distressed during this time? I'm like, oh yes, sir. Was your confidence slower? Oh yes, sir. Was it going as well with the girls? No, sir. Oh, this is emotional distress. We can get fifty grand. Well, as you know, lawsuits take a while. So a year and a half go by. I'm now in the deposition, and the defense attorney's talking to me, and he starts off. He goes. This must have been so emotionally distressed with you, Matthew. And I'm sitting there going, geez, he's giving me a softball. I'm knocking this out of the park. I'm like, yes, it was. But I'm sitting there going, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. All of a sudden, he pulls out from the table that's your book, earmarked, slides it over in front of me, turns it around, opens it up, and it was a picture of me from that year, my senior year. I had won most handsome. <laughs> My dad was like, gosh, Dan, you buddy. He goes, we were going to make $50,000. You got to go off and win most handsome. Come on, man. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so, yeah, we lost. We like we like those suits. We just we're not very good at picking the right litigations in our family. The bomb beyond insanity with a caution. OK. Uh. Okay. I'm not going to look. Oh, yeah. Okay. You start to notice that these get to be a little less about taste. Mm. And they start to go right to your tonsils a little bit. Mm. Mm. And I don't know if it matters what the hell we were putting them on. I think. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, okay. Number eight just reminded me that, yeah, 
you don't want to you don't want to buy a filet mignon or a ribeye to put this on. You might as well get the uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. So one of my favorite Matthew McConaughey quotes is, to understand me, you need to understand Texan logic. And I'm not sure how aware of this you are. These homespun McConaughey-isms, they've inspired, been shared, and memed to a point that they're almost their own internet language. So in order to better understand, I'd like to just bounce a few off of you and get an interpretation from the man himself. No matter who you're in bed with, you're only sleeping with one person, yourself. Fact. Fact. Think about it. No matter who's next to you, there's only one person sleeping on your pillow. One person you can't get rid of. Us. Better shake hands, try and get along. Next. Ah. I'm the best advice that you've ever received. I've had thousands of crises in my life, and most of them never happened. Yep. Don't do false drama. Real drama's coming. Let it slide. A lot of times it ain't a crisis if we just don't give it credit. It's important to realize that fame is a dance, and I'd like to think I've got my dance down better now. Look, my favorite fans are usually the Days fans that are walking down the street. I'm walking one way, they're walking the other. And they'll go, say, man, you got a joint? And I'll hear it, and I go, be a lot cooler if you did. And we both cackle, and we never even looked at each other. And we just cackle through the streets, and then other people in the streets start laughing too. That's my favorite fan. <sighs> Hey, did you bite as big a bite as I did now? That's very serious. So are the next two. Be very careful. Be very careful. So this next one is the Chipotle Express. Pucker butt. (laughs) He didn't Very earthy. Yeah, earthy, earthy sound. Earthy be nice right now. Ah. So recently it was announced that you'd be voicing Hank the Cow Dog in a podcast adaptation of the classic children's book series. Hank the Cow Dog was apparently a big part of the childhood of a lot of people that work here on First We Feast. What can you tell the people about legendary cowboy storyteller John R. Erickson? Well, I got turned on Hank the Cow Dog by Jeff Nichols, the director of Mud. So he brought them to me a couple years ago and turned me on to them. So I listened to a lot of the series. So what you got is Hank the Cow Dog, this cow dog who's head haunts you on the ranch and, you know, thinks he's God gift to ranching and isn't always right. Tells out these tall stories and shares a few lessons along the way. And you get to laugh at him being the uh, sort of hero that he becomes in very funny ways. As well, we're getting them run into different school programs where the students and young kids are learning the lessons of Hank the Cow Dog and the Ranch Hand stories in the classroom. Ah, how about that? I got that out. <laughs> Woo! Ah. And this last one, huh? Last tab. Ah, uh-huh. cheers, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ah. Yeah, babe. I'm babe. Okay, Okay, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, babe. Here we are at the end of our extremely spicy feast, and we've covered a lot of ground. From your new book, Green Lights, to the movies that you've made, and we've soaked up a lot of wisdom along the way, but I want to close by talking about your spiritual side. I know it's very important to you, and to focus it, this 2008 quote, I want to be reincarnated as a jaguar. They're the coolest animals in the world. Do you remember how you first experienced a profound connection with the jaguar? And why do you want to live like one, as one, in another life? Anybody think I might have been hanging out with Woody when I said that one? (laughs) Hee hee! Jaguars just always been, you always been my favorite animal. I don't know why. I hunted down a jaguar in the in the in the jungles of Peru and down into the Uda, down the Utabamba River on the Amazon. And did day tracks and night tracks. Never touched them until I got to Gold, the movie, but did get to track one. Oh, check this out. 
put the uh, Jaguar in gold. I noticed on the call sheet, it happened to be the last scene in the movie. And I'm a producer on the movie, but I go, this is very smart scheduling. But does anyone want to talk about why this is the last scene in the movie? I'm like, well, if something does happen, <laughs> we'll have it in the camera in the movie. I was like, that's good scheduling. Here we go. Well, you know what? I'm happy that you survived that scene and I'm happy that you survived today's meal. And look at you, Matthew McConaughey, working your way through the wings of death. And now there's nothing left to do but roll out the red carpet for you. This camera, or possibly a camera B if you've set one up, let the people know what you have going on in your life. What I got going on in my life, gang, is I'm trying to make it through this whole COVID thing like the rest of us, trying to keep a pulse on what the smart things to do. I hope you're wearing a mask out there because I'm ready to party again too like you are. And the best way we can do that is wear one when we get out in public. What have I been doing right now? I'm on a tour gonna sell my favorite piece of art I've ever put out called Green Life. It's a book I wrote, as you heard from Sean, I went away 52 days, solitary confinement, came out of the desert with something I'm really honored with. It's funny, it's got some wisdom bombs. Hopefully it's gonna help everyone go, one, have a good laugh. Two, maybe learn a little something, get inspired. But also, what green lights are about, man. It's about turning them on and turning some yeses on in our own life and other lives. So hopefully we can all we can go away from the book and go into our life being more green lighters ourselves, man, and create some more opportunities for ourselves and others. And that, sir, is a honey hole. <laughs> good job, man. Good job. I don't know how I got all that out between the heat. <coughs> oh, ah. So let's keep rocking. Catch more of these. Enjoyed it, Sean. See you next time. Thanks for having me. Woo! Hey, what's going on, Hot Ones fans? This is Sean Evans checking in to say thank you so much for watching today's video, and I have very exciting news. The newest member of the Last Dab family is finally here. Say hello to Apollo. The Last Dab Apollo, here's my 30 second review for what it's worth. This is the hottest Last Dab sauce that we've ever made by a lot. I'm actually not even sure if that's a selling point, but it's just fair warning. The Last Dab Apollo, it has that deep, rich, complex flavor profile that Smokin' Ed is known for. Deep, heavy, diesel pepper, big, extreme heat. You don't have to if you don't want to, but if you want to, Heatness.com, Heatness.com, Heatness.com to get your hands on the last dab Apollo. Around here, we call it the gold label.